We'll make a start. Welcome to everyone and thank you for joining our event today to mark the launch of our report New Generation, which presents modelling of the entire electricity system across Europe to identify the cheapest pathways that are compatible with 1.5 degrees global heating. You will hear from colleagues at Ember why a clean power system by 2035 should be at the core of energy planning for net zero. And we're delighted to be joined by guest speakers from the International Energy Agency, Solar Power Europe, Wind Europe, and the Regulatory Assistance Project. And we'll have an interesting discussion later about the next steps in this critical decade. Uh, we'll be inviting questions, uh, so please do use the Q&A tool and upvote the questions you'd like to hear answered. If you have any issues at all, you can message Ember Tech Support. So to begin, let me hand over to Charles Moore, Ember's Europe lead, who has a background in utilities and joined Ember in 2017 after spending five years at RWE. Charles. Thanks for the intro, Hannah, and welcome everybody. Thanks so much for joining. Um, before we dive into the results, I just want to say a few quick words by way of context. Um, so in light of our new European context, um, with unfortunately a war on European soil and a spiraling cost of living crisis, it is now undeniable that fossil fuels are a threat to Europe's economy and its security, as well as fueling global climate change. And we now though have credible alternatives. So the spectacular falls in the cost of wind and solar over the last decade means that clean electricity is now abundant and cheap. And if you combine this with the technology advances outside of electricity, um, the benefits are not limited to the power sector. And whether that's the electric vehicle outside your house or the heat pump heating your office, or even an electrolyzer to provide hydrogen for industry, clean electricity gives you the tools to, to decarbonize the majority of society's energy needs. And for that reason, clean electricity could well be the foundations of a clean, decarbonized and fossil free energy system. And with that in mind, the research we're about to present today set out to identify what does need to happen in the European power sector and by when to meet our climate goals. And how does this compare to the current plans we've set out? And the research provides a wealth of new insights as we've been looking into the European power sector, hour by hour, country by country. But I want to emphasize one key result here to take away, and that is to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement at the lowest cost for European consumers and businesses, it is essential that Europe has a clean power system by 2035. And this builds on the wealth of recent research. There's a growing consensus that 2035 is the key benchmark to judge whether Europe's electricity sector is on track for 1.5C. And of course, reaching that goal will not be easy. And I look forward to the interventions and discussion from our panelists on the challenges and solutions and how we're gonna get there. But with coordinated action from governments, from industry, system operators and crucially citizens, it will be achieved. And the benefits to the economy are, and the security and the climate are, are very clear. And to, to run you through some of those benefits, as well as the full details of study, I'm very really pleased to hand over to uh, Dr. Chris Rosslow, who is the lead author on the study. Thank you. Thanks for that, Charles. That, that's great context. And it, it's my pleasure now to go through some of the results from this new study. Um, that is launched today. So just give me a moment to share my screen and I'll start the presentation. Yeah, so this is our new study um, called New Generation and it's all about building uh, a clean European power system by uh, 2035 and, and why that's uh, necessary um, and how that might be achieved. Uh, just before we start, I'd like to give a quick thanks to um, other Ember analysts, Elizabeth Cremona and Tom Harrison, who helped make this study and also um, modelers from the modeling company Artilis who did all the computations for us on these very complicated power system models. Um, so what I'll do today is go through what we've done and why and how we did that before running through the main findings in a bit more detail and some of the key messages that emerges from this, this modeling. Um, and I'll just finish with a few words on, on limitations and uh, how this analysis 
kind of holds up and fits in with the energy crisis um, that Europe's experiencing right now. So just very briefly to introduce the study, what have we done? Um, why did we do it and how? Um, well, what have we done? We've made three pathways for the European power system. Um, one based on stated policies and two others that are aligned with, with the Paris Agreement, uh, 1.5 degree C. Uh, why have we done that? Well, I think we, we had some questions essentially. So um, beyond phasing out coal, which we all understand as a priority, we wanted some a bit more information um, and, and quantification around the role of gas, but also the need to scale up renewables and the other infrastructure required for, for a renewables led power system. Um, and how we did that was through power system modeling. So very detailed modeling of, um, of the European power system driven by cost minimization, um, but also without exceeding climate boundaries. Just give me a moment, if you will, to explain these three pathways that I just touched on, um, then we'll get into the we'll get into the results after that. So the three pathways, uh, as I mentioned, one aligned with stated policies, um, updated until the end of, of last year, broadly. Um, but the, 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 main, the main kind of result, the main source of our insights that I'll be sharing today is from these two clean power pathways. Um, and the difference between these pathways, um, actually, I'll, sorry, I'll start with what they have in common. They have in common that they're both compatible with 1.5 degrees C and they're driven by cost optimization. So they're trying to find the cheapest solution to, um, to cleaning up Europe's power system. Uh, what they have, uh, what they have, um, how they differ is that the so-called technology-driven scenario here is um, using all power system technologies. Um, and while it is ambitious on electrification and energy savings, it's not as ambitious as our system change pathway, which is inspired by um, the Climate Action Network Europe Paris Agreement compatible scenario, which is a, a grassroots um, energy scenario for the Paris Agreement that's been brought together by civil society uh, across Europe. So we take the power system details from that vision and put those into our system change pathway here, which is very ambitious on electrification, on energy savings, um, also enforces a couple of key asks from European civil society on coal phase out and, and gas phase out. So these two pathways um, will give us the majority of our insights that I'll share today on this 2035 clean power system. Before I go into those insights, I want to quickly hand over to the, to the modelers who, who made these pathways possible, just to explain a little bit briefly about um, the tool that we used uh, to make these pathways. So uh, Luke, if you will, take it away. Yes, um, thank you, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Luke Ambersay, working at the Artelis company, and we, we have done the modeling of the, of the study, mainly. Um, so I, I am just going to quickly give you some info about the power system modeling we used in uh, this study. Um, so in this study, we, we have used the modeling platform Artelis Crystal Supergrid. And in this analysis, the um, 2020-2050 horizon have, have been modeled. And the horizon is represented by a set of five-year periods uh, meaning seven calendar years. So we have modeled 2020, 2025, etc., uh, up to 2050. Um, uh, the model allows for a joint optimization of uh, investment in uh, uh, power capacities and in operation and by using a, a cost minimizing criterion. And the model also simulates the op operational behavior of the system with an hourly time resolution and a country level spatial granularity. The um, geographic area taken into account in our study is the 27 countries of uh, European Union, uh, plus uh, UK, Norway, Switzerland, and Western Balkans, uh, Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia, Bosnia, Kosovo, and Albania. Um, moreover, we, we have uh, represented a lot of different uh, assets of the power system, uh, including different generation technologies, flexible consumption technologies like electric vehicles, etc., storage asset, and interconnection between countries. So this uh, huge optimization problem, uh, 
quite huge with uh, a lot of uh, different uh, variables and constraints has been solved with uh, advanced techniques developed by uh, artists. Uh, thank you, Chris, for the oppor opportunity to show the, the, the model here used in the study. Thank you very much, Luke. Um, yeah, very impressive indeed. So I I'll move on to the, to the main findings. Um, and the, the frame that I want to use to communicate these main findings to you today is really this idea of the power system becoming cleaner and at the same time bigger. And probably the most surprising result of all is um, when we add up all the costs of this, uh, it turns out cheaper. So the, these are the um, three principal messages that I would like you to take away today, if nothing else. Um, so just to unpack that a little bit more, we find that a clean power system by 2035 is essential for 1.5 degrees C and, and net zero in Europe. We find that the power system can be decarbonized and expanded simultaneously at no extra cost of existing plans. And the electrification unlocked by that expansion of the power system and the electricity supply by 2035 could save up to a trillion euros, uh, mostly in avoided fossil fuel costs. So to take the first two aspects of, of those three, the cleaner and, and, and bigger parts, um, we find that the power system, when driven by economic optimization, we reach around 95% uh, from low emission sources by 2035, um, and a really high share from wind and solar. So 70 to 80% from wind and solar um, in a resilient power system uh, as, as proved by the modeling that you just heard about. Um, at the same time as this cleaning up, we're also expanding the power system. Our underlying assumptions um, require a larger power supply and, and, and that is delivered in these clean power pathways. So as I just mentioned, the power supply is, is increasing um, and uh, a larger proportion of that as we go from right, left to right across these scenarios is going into, into green hydrogen. So, um, this, this allows both direct and indirect electrification to, to, to increase throughout the economy. And when we try, when we add up all the costs associated with this, so the costs of investing in new wind and solar and expanding the power system, strengthening interconnection and so on, um, the, the remarkable result really is that the, the costs in the power system are, are comparable by 2035 across these scenarios. And that really does speak to the, the remarkable cost reductions in wind and solar um, that we just heard about. As a result of that increased electrification, what we see in, when we look at the wider system is, is, is a reduction in costs. So as electricity pushes out the use of fossil fuels in transport and in heating, essentially Europe's fossil fuel bill is reduced. And this is the source of the one trillion savings by 2035 that I mentioned previously. So some other key messages that I have here, um, mostly, mostly related to how exactly this system might, might, be, uh, might be realized um, are, of course, wind and solar, an enormous expansion is required with the growth rate quadrupling this decade. To allow that to happen, increasing system flexibility is, is, is crucial. And I'll go into the technologies that we see as providing that in, in these model pathways. Of course, there are clear implications for fossil fuels uh, and the deadlines that we see emerging from this modeling in terms of coal and gas in the power system. Uh, and then security of supply, uh, kind of what, what, is, what is required, you know, as we go into this uh, higher electricity demand future. So to start with wind and solar, compared to the last decade of growth, um, we see the, the growth rates quadrupling uh, in, in, in this decade and being sustained uh, until 2035. Uh, obviously, that's, that's an enormous challenge. Um, you can see that visualized here compared to the historic growth rates, what happens in these pathways. Um, there are some signs of acceleration. So the, the combined growth, I think, in the last decade was around 25 gigawatts per year in Europe. 2021, uh, that increased to 36. Um, so the things are going in the right direction, but what our clean power pathways here require is actually over hundred gigawatts of growth every single year in wind and solar combined, uh, leading up to 2035. Now, you might be asking the question, is this amount of growth feasible? 
well, we'll hear from Solar Power Europe and, and Wind Europe, the industry bodies uh, in the discussion that follows this presentation. Um, but uh, just to quickly say that the, the, some scenarios from Solar Power Europe earlier this year um, are aligning with this kind of, this kind of growth rate. So um, if given the right political tailwinds, it does seem like uh, for solar power, these growth rates are possible. But wind power, I think it's fair to say that there are, there are more challenges um, there are even challenges uh, in, in, de in deploying the wind capacity required for current targets. Um, I'm, I'm sure we'll come on to that and explore that issue in, in more detail in the discussion. Another point that I'd like to emphasize is um, you've seen the detailed modeling that we, that we did to produce these pathways. And what we find is that wind and solar um, can be the backbone of a resilient power system in 2035. So we, we looked at, um, we looked at uh, so-called Duncan flow conditions where you have high demand coinciding with um, anomalously low wind and solar output. And what we find is um, the system can be resilient to such conditions. So these, these two charts show the hourly profile across um, what we identified as, as the most challenging week for the power system. Uh, the eagle-eyed among you might be able to see that wind and solar actually still supply quite a lot uh, in this period. Uh, and that's because if you look at the literature, many analyses of, 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 of agree that the weather, the weather systems that pass over Europe um, typically don't affect the entire European system at once. That's one of the reasons why increasing interconnection in the European system uh, we see as so vital because that can help to, to address geographic imbalances as well as temporal imbalances uh, in, in the power system. But the key takeaway here is that we've used uh, several, you know, a whole range of weather conditions. We've even stress tested this system um, using very cold conditions. Um, and what we find is that the system is resilient, even with uh, such a high average share of wind and solar up at 70 to 80 percent. A few technologies uh, we see as quite key to enabling this. Um, so as I mentioned, we see interconnection the system doubling by 2035. Um, hydrogen electrolysis uh, is also uh, increasing, enabled by an increasing fleet of electrolyzers. So even though wind and solar are 70 to 80 percent of the average annual power supply, there are many hours of the year where wind and solar actually combined exceed demand. So uh, during these times, what's happening in the modeling is that extra demand is being used to produce green hydrogen. We also see some new clean dispatchable sources of power, uh, firm sources of power entering the system by 2035. What are the messages for fossil fuels from these pathways? Well, there are a few um, clear sort of deadlines, if you will. Um, we achieved the outcome of uh, 2030 coal phase outs. That message comes through to us from these pathways. Also by 2035, um, in line with recommendations from the IEA and others on from uh, surrounding a, regarding advanced economies, um, gas power is less than 5% by 2035. Um, another finding that we, we have is on uh, the need for new infrastructure. We find that there's there's no need for new base load gas power stations after 2025. Uh, in other words, no new projects compared to what's currently what's currently planned regarding base load gas. And on the right here, you can see the evolution of the gas and coal fleets in in Europe, uh, reducing to different extents in these pathways. All that comes together um, in this in this final point that I'd like to emphasize, uh, and, th and this is slightly more technical, but I think is, is very interesting. And one of the things that surprised us most about this modeling is that the these cost optimized pathways actually require a smaller and cleaner dispatchable fleet um, of power stations than uh, we would have if uh, in the state of policy case. So this is despite uh, growth in power demand and also growth in peak power demand. The system can be secure, um, dominated by wind and solar, and we, do, we don't need a, a fleet of conventional power stations that's as large as today. That means that coal power stations and gas power stations can be phased out, and, and we see a different role for different new technologies, new clean dispatchable technologies uh, towards 2035, and those are explored through these different, these different pathways. Um, 
new nuclear we find is not cost competitive, but to explore, but to kind of really probe that finding, um, we, we also made a version of these pathways where nuclear projects are deployed uh, as planned. And we find that that has relatively small impact on system costs. Uh, of course, there are other trade-offs there regarding nuclear waste um, uh, and so on, um, which need to be balanced. It becomes more of an equation of balancing risks than these technology choices. Um, but we do see a role for new clean dispatchable technologies from 2035. I think the key point to take away here is that no single technology is, is, is absolutely essential for that. Um, there are different options and there's a lot more discussion of this in the report if this is you. I'd just like to finish with a few words on, on limitations uh, of, of this modeling. So um, I'd like to make it clear that maybe some sources of flexibility on the system are not included here. So when it comes to the need for um, Gas capacity, for example, in the future, those things, that, that is possibly overestimated. This is a power system only model. These pathways are driven by cost minimization. And of course, that's not the only factor in power system decisions, but uh, it, it should be an overriding, or at least a very important factor because um, cheap electricity uh, is, is something that, that we need for kind of wider decarbonization. I'd like to make sort of point out that this, these, this modeling was done before um, the war in Ukraine, which means that recent increases in ambition are not included in the stated policy pathway. Um, but at this, at this stage, things like the Repower EU plan do represent increased ambition and not concrete committed plans. So the stated policy pathway, um, I think we think is still representative of, of, the, of the, those committed plans by national governments in Europe. And the recent price in fossil fuels is not factored in here. And the main impact that would have is probably an underestimation of the stated policy pathway. So that one trillion in savings that I mentioned at the start of the presentation, likely higher, uh, particularly if these increased fossil fuel prices persist. So thanks for your attention. Thanks for staying with me through that summary of our new report, New Generation. You can read more on our website. Um, and now I'd love to take some of your questions. Thanks again. Thanks, Chris. Um, I can see we've got some questions uh, come through to the Q&A tool. So if you want to stop sharing your screen, um, people can see, see you a bit more clearly. Um, so the most upvoted question that we've got here is a question from Philippe Kirion. Um, he asks, stated policies are often self-contradictory with targets not consistent with enacted policies. Isn't your stated policy scenario too optimistic by assuming that member states will implement all of the policies they have announced? Thanks for the question. Um, the stated policy pathway, rather than being optimistic, I would say, could be interpreted as, 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 as the opposite. So we only, we, we're very careful to only include I would say official plans, official commitments in the state of policy pathway. There are some increases in ambition that have been announced since we made the cutoff, if you like, for information going into the state of policy pathway. Um, so that's the first thing to say uh, on that one. The, this, the, the increased ambition uh, from things like the Repower EU plan um, will eventually filter down into those national policies and European policies, but that's not yet represented by the state of policy pathway. So. Uh, we, we think it is a fair representation of, of what is likely to happen um, uh, given committed official national plans as they stood uh, at the end of last year. Thanks, Chris. And then we're getting a few other questions, um, particularly around understanding what clean dispatchable sources were considered in the modeling. And in particular questions about uh, the role for um, gas plants using green hydrogen, um, and is that factored in with the hydrogen ele electrolyzer capacity that uh, the model produces? Yes, I appreciate. I went over those details quite quickly um, on on those. They are quite quite technical. Um, so the different pathways have different options available for investments in terms of dispatchable capacities. So the system change pathway. Um, as part of the storyline, there's there's no CCS involved. So uh, hydrogen turbines are the main 
source of the tobacco capacity available for investments. And on your question around the hydrogen supply, the models, the pathways are completely self self sufficient in terms of hydrogen for the wider economy and also for the power sector. So if you like, that's a that's a, a loop that we have built into the modeling that any hydrogen required for balancing in the power sector is produced by electrolysis um, in the same pathways. The technology driven scenario has has um, more options available in terms of dispatchable capacity. So there's CCS and hydrogen turbines. Um, hydrogen turbines take a little longer to develop in that pathway. Um, I think, and, and that's a result of um, a longer role for the conventional fossil fleet um, as, as that moves from providing generation to providing capacity. So gas power stations increasingly provide capacity rather than generation. Um, and they stay on the system for longer in the technology driven pathway and the system change pathway, which forces closure dates by certain times. And that's why we see earlier deployments of hydrogen turbines uh, in, in that system change pathway. Thanks so much, Chris. We've got lots of interesting questions coming in, um, but we will move on to the round table now and Chris will um, type answers uh, into the Q&A. So um, we'll get to all of these questions and you'll be able to see um, the answer to those there. Uh, thank you for, for all engaging uh, to this point. Um, so I'd now um, like to introduce our four uh, guest panelists who will be joining us to discuss how we can actually unlock clean power across Europe. Um, so we're joined by Brent Warner, the head of the World Energy Outlook Power Sector Unit at the International Energy Agency. Naomi Cheviar, the head of Re regulatory affairs at Solar Power Europe. Ram Kleis, senior advisor at Regulatory Assistance Project. And Pierre Tardieu, the chief Poli policy officer at Wind Europe. Thank you all for joining us. Um, to start the discussion off, I'd like to invite all of the speakers to take one minute to each give us one reason why Europe should target clean power by 2035 and one key challenge that needs to be tackled. Um, so let's go in the order, Naomi, Pierre, Brent, and then Bram. Great. First of all, I, I wanted to say uh, thanks for, for inviting us, but most importantly, thank you for this report. Uh, I think it brings a lot of good uh, elements, uh, especially on solar and wind integration that uh, that are really bringing a lot of things to debate. So, so great report and thank you for, for this. Um, why should Europe target green power by 2035? Because it's the only way uh, to... Um, to to really uh, divide the system now we we see gas uh, prices that are um, very high uh, and that are likely to stay high in the in the medium term. Um, we also see um, a need for uh, a more to accompany the distributed uh, electrification of the system with uh, with electric vehicle, which also uh, shows a need to uh, to deploy distributed energies like like solar. So so I think it's really the the only way. Um, when it comes to challenges, uh, it's difficult to identify one key challenge. I, I think I'll probably let uh, Pierre uh, mention permitting. W one thing that I maybe would like to uh, mention is the question of grid integration. We see this being uh, an increasing issue for both ground-mounted projects. We have some problems in the in Denmark, for example, where the grid uh, connection fee is prohibited, prohibitive, but also increasingly uh, at the distributed level also for, for rooftop PV. Uh, and here, uh, that solving that will really be a challenge. Um, we know that there are a lot of good practices uh, that uh, DSOs and TSOs could implement to make things easier. We know there are a lot of technologies that could be deployed in the grid, but somehow uh, change. this change is not uh, going through. And, uh, and a key element is probably to change a bit the mission of the, the grid operators um, and, and work on making sure they have the right incentives and in particular financial incentives to deploy these best practices and these new uh, technologies. I go next, yeah? All right, thank you very much. Uh, also from my side for this, uh, for this excellent study. Um, why do it? I mean, it's very simple. It's the energy efficient and cost effective pathway. There, there's none other. Um, and in a resource scarce environment in which we are, we really can't afford to have any 
sunken investments uh, going forward. This was already true before, but now with the Ukraine war, it really hit the politicians in the face. And it's really important now to come out with these well-articulated you know, uh, analyses and strategies to show that this, is, uh, that this is possible. Challenges, permitting, of course, we'll come back to that. The grids, uh, we talked about integration, but we also need a lot of copper. Now, Europe has been under-investing um, in, in the electricity grids at all voltage levels in spite of a you know, very favorable economic environment with low interest rates in the last few years, we need to do a lot more. And then there's one thing which is very fundamental and specific to the wind industry is that um, the supply chain is really struggling. Uh, the turbine manufacturers are not making any money right now, which means that they can't invest in scaling up. And so we need to rethink renewable energy auctions in ways that actually value the contribution to society not only of the cheapest possible electron, but also what deploying renewables and wind in particular contribute in terms of economic developments, contribution to the environment, system integration, et cetera, all of which has a cost, but all of which has a value to society. If we do that, we can definitely scale up uh, and meet what's been described in the report. I think I might've been next. But uh, so thank you also, let me echo the others for welcoming this great report. Uh, and thanks for, for walking us through it today, Chris. Um, I think uh, for me, the, the why is very much, uh, is a question of leadership. So uh, Europe has the opportunity to lead us through and be one of the leaders in clean energy transitions going forward. We know very clearly that electricity is poised to lead the way. Um, through our own work on a net zero by 2050 strategy, electricity is, is really poised because the technologies are here. We, the costs are, are down for solar and wind. We have the chance, electricity has a chance to run and Europe can be one of those leaders proving the way that this is possible, this is affordable, this is reliable and the, for the rest of the world also uh, to follow suit. Uh, on the challenge, I would, I would echo those already, already mentioned, but I would also focus on having uh, the market designs in place for electricity that will be critical to underpinning tomorrow's energy systems. Markets were developed and organized around fossil fuels, around dispatchable sources. That's not the system of tomorrow. We need those markets to be ready to support and actually drive the investment, drive the innovation, drive the effective and efficient operations of these systems. Uh, for the system of tomorrow. And I think that is a very difficult question. It's a very active area, but uh, something that will be a very serious challenge to overcome to, to get there. Thanks. Great, and then I, I think it's uh, up to me. Uh, good uh, afternoon, everybody, and, and thank you uh, for uh, the opportunity to uh, contribute to this discussion. And, and thanks a lot for the, the great work. Uh, this is uh, very timely and, and very important. So. Um, congratulations on that. Uh, I mean, I think the, the why, why, why should we do this? Uh, I think we're all living through very um, uh, distressing and and uh, and, and um, uh, challenging times. And I think one of the contributions of uh, this work uh, is showing how uh, the transition of the electricity system first is a key way of uh, protecting consumers uh, as well as mitigating geopolitical risks. Um, and so this is, um, uh, I think, a message that uh, our European leaders um, uh, will take to heart and, and hopefully uh, act on. And, and because this, this uh, model, for me, uh, one of the big contributions is showing how the electricity system can work reliably based on uh, very um, high levels of variable renewables, uh, which is a, a key discussion point still. And then on, on the challenges, I mean, I, I echo the ones that have already been uh, mentioned, uh, but uh, I, I would like uh, uh, to stress the one uh, or add to the one that, that Brent just uh, um, mentioned, which is making sure basically that the uh, regulatory framework for markets uh, to play the role that they're best at um, to, 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 to make them play that role. Um, they are really um, core to um, give the right investment and, and dispatch uh, signals. 
uh, using the right resources at the right time in the right place. So uh, we have a lot of work to do still, um, and it's gonna create um, uh, the need for the paradigm shift uh, to um, give the right temporal and locational price signals and use those price signals uh, to drive um, investments as well as, as, uh, as demand. Um, because one of the key resources that we're going to need, and that is also shown in the study, is, um, of course, high flexibility uh, from all possible sources, both on the generation, but importantly, also on storage and, and demand side. Um, so uh, we urgently need to recognize uh, the demand side flexibility as the proper resource that it is. Um, we're making headway on that, but we, we're still definitely not there. Um, so uh, I think that's that's the biggest uh, challenge uh, for, uh, from our side. Thank you. Thanks, Bram. Um, so I'm going to turn to to Brent first. You you know you mentioned the role that Europe can play in in really a leadership role globally in uh, taking forward the electricity transition. Obviously, as the um, you know leading and the power model, power sector modeling for the IEA's World Energy Outlook, you have a deep understanding of where governments are heading and, and whether that aligns with what's needed for net zero. You know, from your um, understanding, how big is the gap between Europe's current pledges for the power sector and net zero? And what's changed in Europe since the outbreak of the Ukraine war and amidst the ongoing gas crisis? Yeah, thanks, Hannah. Thank, I mean, a very important question, I think, is, is measuring this sort of, uh, the way we think about it is sort of, an is there an ambition gap? Uh, which I think is very much your question, and is there an implementation gap? And I think those are are both very relevant, uh, certainly for Europe, but but everywhere around the world. Um, if we look at the in our assessment of the the national energy and climate plans, if we look over the next decade across Europe, you would be cutting emissions by something like half in the power sector uh, over the decade. So from 2020 to 2030. Now. Even since that, our last assessment in the last World Energy Outlook uh, in last, last October, um, we've also noted that 2021 was record higher emissions at the global level uh, from a rebound from, from the COVID pandemic. Now, of course, the current energy crisis following uh, the, the war in Ukraine, it's putting us already a, a little bit almost behind schedule, if you like. I mean, the discussions are very much about the near term. But even if you fulfill those plans, you're still talking about cutting those emissions across the power sector, across Europe by about half. Now that means to get to zero by 2035, you've only got five years to do the other half of the job. So I think very clearly more needs to be done than what's already codified in those national energy and climate plans. And that's, we're very happy, I mean, seeing this discussion within the European Union, uh, Fit for 55, now some of the proposals coming through in Repower EU. These are certainly a step in the right direction for accelerating the pace of renewables deployment and cutting the reliance on imported natural gas uh, from Russia in particular. These are both positive steps in the right direction. Do they go far enough to, to close the gap to a net zero pathway? Uh, remains to be seen in the sort of details that, that comes together when we, when we put these together, but clearly this is raising the ambitions in the right direction, closing the gap, um, but implementing them is still takes time. I mean, we, we know very well within the European Union, the process takes, uh, takes quite a bit of time to formalize and then following through with those, um, I think we, we see as being very positive, but it does mean that 2035 is quite close. Uh, and I think that's, that's a very relevant point when we're talking about some of the elements we've already raised around grids, around renewables integration, around market designs, 2035 is not very far off to get a lot of things right. So I think there is the need for increased urgency in, all, in these aspects um, to make it clear what needs to be done for all the players. Uh, and that point on grids, just to, to focus on that for a moment, I think that's one area where clearly, if there's not a very strong commitment and a long-term vision for how the countries are within Europe are going to get to net zero emissions, then we're very unlikely to have the grids there in a timely way at the right time to support that trend, that, that transition. 
Uh, and we, we know that the scaling up the renewable side, uh, there's a lot of momentum there, but I think the grid side, the business case can be a little bit slower, a little bit harder to make and can take a decade for those assets to go through the permitting, licensing and actual completion stages. So uh, I think I'll leave it there and uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Brent. We also found in the modeling that the Repower EU commitments do bring the EU much closer to the wind and solar targets identified in the modeling. But like you said, there's a now an implementation gap perhaps um, in our hands. And so it's a good moment to turn to our colleagues who are joining us here from Wind Europe and Solar Power Europe uh, to talk about how we can make this a reality on the ground. Uh, so Pierre, you know, Repower EU recognized the urgent need to accelerate wind permitting, but your recent outlook noted that EU deployment is likely to even fall short of the Fit for 55 objectives. Um, at Wind Europe, what best practices are you calling on countries to implement and are there other major, major barriers to higher de deployment? Yeah, yeah. No, clearly, as you said, I mean, there's, a, there's an implementation gap uh, for the time being. Um, our outlook, which you just referred to, um, foresees roughly 18 gigawatt on average uh, per year for the next five years. And now with Repower EUs, I mean, that requires having 510 gigawatts of wind in the EU installed by 2030, we would need 39 gigawatts. So from 18 to 39, so roughly, roughly double, basically a little bit more than a little bit more than double. Um, we focused on, on, on the challenges. I'd like to emphasize what is not a challenge here. The technology development is not a challenge. The technology is absolutely able to deliver, nor is the finance. Um, there were 43 billion euros invested in, in wind energy in Europe last year. Uh, the finance community knows these technologies now. They're very comfortable with them. Uh, and these projects are attracting uh, a lot of investments and will attract more if we just have enough permits. And this is where the rubber meets the road, really. Uh, Repower EU has some really good legislative proposals uh, on permitting, um, proposing, for example, to consider renewables in the overriding public interests, and that'll help the permitting authorities to really strike the right working balance, for example, between renewables deployment and, and biodiversity production. I was discussing with uh, Belgian colleagues this morning, they're, all, they're saying that this proposal from the European Commission is already having an impact on the ground, making you know permitting authorities and policymakers rethink uh, how they how they strike that balance. And very importantly, the European Commission not only proposed legislation, but they also embraced a number of good practices, um, as you said, to accelerate permitting. Uh, let, let me give you a couple of examples. One is uh, having permits that are flexible in the technology specifications that allow you to deploy the latest machines. If you put in a permit five years ago um, with a specific, you know, a specification, a tech spec from five years ago, you may not be able to find that turbine on the market uh, anymore, simply because it's, it's a very dynamic market. There are new models coming out uh, all the time and, and the machine may not be available. Um, so that's that's one problem that can be fixed relatively uh, easily with simply the right approach to, to flexible permitting. The other thing is simply clarifying who does what in the permitting authorities. There are so many conflicts of competence uh, at the regional, national, local level, whatever it may be. To come back to my Belgian uh, um, colleagues here, there are two ministers in charge of permitting in Wallonia. One is green, loves renewables, you know, permits and wants to permit everything. The other is more conservative, you know, and, and, and blocks every single uh, project. Yeah. So just by clarifying who does what, uh, we would really, you know, uh, move the needle. Um, and finally, and this is just a broader point that uh, goes beyond permitting, but we need, we need these processes to be digitalized. They're far too paper-based still today. Um, Developers are still moving, you know, wheelbarrows of paper in order to get projects through, and this just can't work uh, in 2022 now. So, three things to keep in mind uh, to move the needle, and I think we can get there. Thanks so much, Pierre. 
Um, Naomi, we, we saw with the EU solar strategy published alongside Repower EU that the Com European Commission substantially increased 2030 solar targets. Um, this has you know, big implications for integration and ensuring a reliable supply. So how does Solar Power Europe see grid integration changing to support higher and higher solar penetration? And what else needs to happen to ensure a rapid scale up of solar power? Yes, yeah, so maybe I, I want to come back on the word uh, substantially increase, uh, just to give you a bit of context. Um, the Commission indeed uh, proposed a new target uh, of uh, 750 gigawatt uh, direct current, which is the, the, the unit we use in our industry. Uh, but uh, when we looked at uh, what the tendency was for us uh, by 2030, knowing that it's very difficult to do market forecasts by 2030, but taking a bit the, the trends in the next uh, four years and and extrapolating a bit based on the on the scenarios that we would see um we estimated that in eu 27 only we would reach 690 uh, gigawatt dc of solar pv in 2030 and uh, and i think your scenario for example in the stated policies it says is at 450 gigawatt uh in uh, in europe so even beyond the eu 27 and I think um, so. We are very happy with the with the figures of the commission because it goes higher than the uh, than the than what we have seen as business as usual. But it also shows that um, where we have a chronic problem with modeling solar PV in uh, in, uh, in 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 energy modelings and. Um, I mean, even even in in your scenarios, because with the business as usual scenarios, we're below what we have, uh, what we see uh, by by twenty thirty. Uh, but again, still a very nice figure, and uh, and I think now the 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 objective for us is uh, working at delivering it uh, and de delivering the the figure um, for grid integration. I, I already uh, mentioned it. I think uh, there is um, a lot of uh, a lot of work to do. The first thing is really having visibility on uh, on what will be the challenges because uh, I think your report looked at uh, balancing, but we know that there are a lot of issues with grid stability with grid congestions etc and and here we don't have uh, we, we also need i mean that then the problems become very very uh, national and so we need national grid operators that look at that and that make scenarios and and uh, anticipate the issues that uh, that they will have um and i think we're really working at uh, at pushing the TSOs and DSOs doing that at your level. It's uh, it's difficult, but uh, but the clean energy package proposed that DSOs do these grid development plans. Uh, so that that will be uh, important. Um, the second point where we would like to see things evolve is, as mentioned, uh, encourage uh, TSOs and DSOs to uh, invest more in alternatives to uh, coppers. Uh, I also fully agree with Pierre that uh, investing in copper is a uh, no-go. We we have to uh, we will have to invest into coppers, but uh, we also should look at how flexibility can uh, lower these investment needs. Also, smart grids. Uh, we've seen. Uh, I think it's in the Netherlands that they evolved a bit on the n minus one rule uh, because they implemented some smart grid solutions and they had more observability on uh, on exactly what was the the transport capacity of the grid uh, and the last point will be the the need to deploy uh, smarter technologies um we, we we really need to deploy uh, storage solar and storage capacities on the grid uh wind and solar uh projects on the grid and um and and we still have a number of uh, questions on uh, to which extent it's doable uh, in the in the EU. So this is a, an important point that will be uh, pushing on the um, on the EU agenda. And then what other challenges? I uh, I would really like to echo the the point of Pierre on supply chains. Uh, I think this will be also an important challenge for us. Uh, you you know uh, I, I'm sure you know uh, what the supply chain of solar uh, looks like. Um, we uh, we need to work on that at diversifying where solar modules are uh, are manufactured and and uh, at Solar Power Europe we've been working on uh, on that. We we set the objective of re-establishing a strategic uh, manufacturing capacity in Europe at uh, 20 gigawatt level. So there this is a, an important area of work. Maybe more relevant to this conversation is also uh, the need to work on inverter supply chains because our technologies are uh, interfaced with power electronics. And, uh, and out of the top three uh, solar inverters today, there are two of them that are really suffering from the semiconductor shortage, so shortages 
and uh, getting this right, making sure also that uh, across the globe uh, and including the EU manufacturers have access to uh, to semiconductors and working hand in hand with the CHIPS Act effort uh, in the EU will also be very important. Thanks, Naomi. And obviously, underpinning all of this, Europe will need to ensure that policy and regulation is up to the job. Um, but I'm at the Regulatory Assistance Project. You've recently been part of publishing a blueprint on how to design the regulatory context for clean power by 2035. Um, so what have you identified as some of the main issues with current market design that are holding back a rapid transition? And how can these be solved? Yeah, thank you indeed. Uh, we, um, we saw that there's of course uh, a lot of uh, discussion and, and certainly over the past couple of months over the um, functioning of the uh, electricity markets and uh, and uh, uh, regulation uh, providing framework for uh, electricity markets and so uh, we pulled together a um, a blueprint uh, it's online I can provide you with uh, with the link it's uh, available for everybody uh, that pulls together the uh, essential blocks of a future zero emission power system by 2035. Um, and we, we try to take a systems view um, because we're going to need an integrated plan uh, of regulatory solutions uh, for the transition uh, to make it both efficient, uh, cost efficient, uh, energy efficient, uh, but also equitable. Um, and they're, they're designed to uh, galvanize, so to, see, uh, so to say, a, a dirty for clean capacity swap, uh, because the main challenge uh, that we have is to uh, create room uh, for uh, clean resources, both on the demand uh, and on the generation side, um, by removing uh, overcapacity of um, gas and, and coal uh, and, uh, and nuclear from, uh, from the system. Um, so we need to optimize network investments as well and, and safeguard, safeguard uh, efficient uh, spending and consumption decisions through transparent, uh, transparent pricing. Um, so it's the toolbox. We, we don't think that uh, the uh, fundamentals of uh, the uh, price formation uh, in the um, European power market are broken. Uh, so those do not need a fix, um, but we do need uh, additional safeguards and, and reinforcements uh, to uh, protect the consumers um, from the extreme pricing cap, uh, impacts. Um, so I think that's, that's where uh, the work is. Uh, we need to uh, get energy efficiency to begin to, to really become uh, the first uh, resource that we that, that we deploy um, and uh, we need uh, a better functioning uh, forward um, market uh, reinforcing um, uh, that for market through uh, better um, conditions for long term uh, power purchase agreements, including across borders, uh, will be uh, important and coupled, coupling that to um, for those technologies that, that still need support or in, increased uh, security, coupling that with uh, double sided uh, contracts for differences is, is I think, uh, increasingly recognized as, as the way forward. Um, but on the short term, short term markets, uh, I think the, the biggest challenge is to uh, make sure that um, flexibility on the demand side gets uh, full access to uh, balancing markets uh, to uh, support uh, the um, uh, the uh, the uh, electricity system um, operators um, uh, and that's currently um, still a big challenge in, in most uh, European uh, markets um, but also make sure and, and coupled to that uh, that consumers um, can play an active role uh, for which uh, digitalization uh, will be uh, a really important uh, precondition. Um, but the, the good thing is that we, we, we see the way forward, the technologies are there. Uh, there's obviously a lot of room for innovation. Um, I think we need the uh, resolve to, to make it happen. And I think this, this report uh, helps because it shows that it actually increases uh, um, uh, cost efficiency and, and ensures uh, uh, reliability, which has always been kind of the um, the thing holding us back. Uh, is the system actually going to work? Well, you show that it can work. Uh, we just need to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. Thanks so much. Um, I've been keeping an eye on the on the questions here, and I um, have seen that Chris has been 
um, steadily responding to the remaining questions. And I think we don't have any further for our, for our panelists. Um, would anyone like to share any final remarks before we, before we close the session or comment in, on anything that the others mentioned? Pierre, do go ahead. I'd really like to echo what, uh, what Brahm just said about market design. I, I, I was uh, listening carefully to everything that you said, and I think uh, we're extremely well aligned uh, on, on what needs to happen on the market design and crucially what does not need to happen. Uh, as you said, the price formation mechanism is, is not broken. Um, uh, so, you know, the marginal price setting mechanism needs to be kept, it needs to be maintained. Uh, there are dissenting voices at the very top of the European Commission on that, but I think I think it's very important that we don't lose our marbles here in, in, in a time of crisis uh, and change something which is not broken. Because if we embark on an adventure here to fundamentally alter the European electricity market design, then the entire discussion that we're having today is completely academic because nobody will invest in anything. Maybe if I, if I could, one quick comment is, I mean, I think we, we've touched on it in a number of different ways, but to say very clearly that obviously the transitions need to be as just uh, for everyone and equitable. Um, it was mentioned, I mean, the affordability of energy is very much at the heart of that. And I mean, I welcome one of the, the key messages of this report that um, a decarbonized electricity sector doesn't mean a more expensive electricity sector. Uh, I think that's um, somehow, you know, we're, that's the advantage a bit of the electricity system and the technologies that are here now. Uh, five, 10 years ago, you know, it wasn't, wasn't the case or it wasn't um, as, as solid as actually the technologies are here in our hands. So it's a, it's a great opportunity uh, for Europe and, and really the world to kind of demonstrate that. Thanks. Maybe uh, last thoughts on my side, um, just to echo what Brent, you said earlier, the, the importance of implementation as we go uh, more in details on, on how the regulation should be shaped. So the go-to area is a, is a perfect example. Um, yeah, I think here uh, we really should be active as an industry to make sure that best practices are circulating, that areas where there is the renewable potential, but not yet the regulatory frameworks have access to uh, to um, what had happened in, in other countries. Uh, in the Commission, I think uh, things are moving on, on permitting. There is a, a lot of dialogue. Uh, similarly, I think there is a good dialogue between uh, distribution system operators that uh, are not necessarily staffed as much as TSOs on, uh, on all of these good practices. And we, this will be really an important point to, uh, to uh, realize the ambition uh, that we want to achieve collectively at, at European level. Thanks, Naomi. And as we're now nearing the end of our session, I'll, I'll draw the conversation to a close. Um, I'd like to thank all of the panelists, uh, Brent, Naomi, Pierre and Bram. Um, thank you for such an interesting discussion. You've all made a very clear case for the need for decarbonizing Europe's electricity by 2035. Um, there's much work to do and we look forward to continuing that work with you. Um, in the coming years. Thank you to all of the attendees um, who, who joined and asked so, such excellent questions. Please do get in touch with Chris, uh, Charles or um, Elizabeth or Tom, who were the kind of lead authors on this report with any further questions about the study. Um, it's certainly an exciting decade ahead and we, and we look forward to working with you all as we transform Europe's power sector to pave the way for net zero. Thank you so much. Thank you, bye.